All right, I think we'll get um, started now. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, this will be a joint webinar hosted by TD Cynix, uh, AxonSoft and NetApp. I'm David Trujillo, sales engineer with AxonSoft, and I'm joined by um, Don Kennedy and David Smith from TD Cynix, as well as Scott Bartlett from NetApp. And we'll be presenting our one-stop solution for effective security in uh, gaming and casinos. So we'll start off with a few um, company intros. Um, Sorry. There we are. So a little bit about AxonSoft, if you don't know about it. Uh, we're a global software company. We have 600 employees in 40 offices around the world. And we've helped out uh, over 13,000 customers in 140 different countries. So that equates to about half a million different projects that we've worked on. And we have years of experience in the video analytics and surveillance industry. Um, we have 30 patents to our company's name and have been uh, disrupting uh, techno um, disruptive technologies for many years now. Yeah, David. Uh, so my name is Scott Bartlett. I'm the business development manager for intelligent video and analytics at NetApp. And as you can see from the slide, you know NetApp's a, a global data services company with offices all over the world. Uh, our e-service products uh, are the perfect go-to system for casinos because they're simple and reliable. It doesn't matter from a small to mid-sized casino to large casinos or basically anyone who requires fast, simple, reliable storage solutions. The e-service products, you know, they're really, they're purposefully built for data intensive applications like video analytics and video surveillance. Uh, and with that, I will hand it off to Don. Thanks, Scott. Hey, good morning and good afternoon to all, and thank you for joining us today. Most of you are very familiar with Tech Data and Synex, and as the numbers highlight here, the combination of the two created TD Synex, and we are the world's largest IT distribution company. We sit the center of the technology partner ecosystem, and our unique position gives us the opportunity to lead as a solutions aggregator, as well as an ideas aggregator. TD Synex connects the IT ecosystem to information and resources together by providing the broadest range of AV security, IT solutions, pre-sales design, integration, and post-sale support. We enable our partners to expand their reach. Back over to you, David. Thanks, Don. So uh, we'll present a little bit about our solution. Um, one big issue in casinos is that um, there tends to be lots of cameras that um, that have to cover a large amount of area in the casino. And um, of course, these sorts of systems are going to be upgraded over time, which uh, often means that there's going to be a large variety of different cameras and systems involved. So uh, one central component of our solution, our AxonSoft's Axon1 VMS, has support for uh, tens of thousands of different camera models. Um, we're a vendor agnostic platform. so. There's no lock-in to a particular vendor of camera. Any camera that has support for uh, OnVIF prof uh, profiles will work with the system. And the system supports a mix uh, of different cameras. You can have any different variety of different vendors or different types of systems, uh, all seamlessly integrated into one single platform. So uh, all sorts of different kinds of cameras will work with the system. Here's an example, for example, of uh, fisheye lenses dome cameras, PTZ cameras, all of those are going to work fine with the system and integrate perfectly. So I know we talked about this a bit earlier, um, Scott, but uh, we, we were discussing how these systems tend to be upgraded over time. Do you have any yeah. takes on yeah, that? I do. I mean, I think, again, the importance of being agnostic is it's like you said, if you look at the, the life cycle of a casino, you've got a new build, then five to seven years, there'll be some expansions and then probably a new head end. And then same thing again, another five to seven years, more expansions and the casinos grow. So you have, you know, multiple generations of cameras. So the fact that you support over 10,000 camera models and are vendor agnostic really is a true value, a true value to gaming and casinos. Absolutely. That's a really uh, great insight into, into how things work because uh, that's something that people will often be worried about. And uh, <laughs> be concerned about you know, replacing their whole system. It's, it, it wouldn't be very good if people had to just tear out all their cameras uh, when integrating a new solution like this. So uh, would you like to uh, talk a little bit more about some of uh, NetApp solutions regarding this and the storage of all the video collected from these cameras? 
Yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the biggest issues or concerns for a casino who wants to upgrade their technology or even build a new casino, it's really, it's the mindset of the industry. So the industry's got a very, you know, analog Lego based mindset. And, you know, what I mean by that is, you know, we, we basically went from a VCR to a DVR to an MBR. So the industry has got that appliance based mindset, right? Where in reality, the CPU should always be disaggregated from storage, right? You know, let the CPU handle the compute and let the SAN handle the storage load, right? That's what they're built for. So NetApp has the ability to scale from a very, very small footprint, like a 4U config, all the way up to 10 petabytes in a single equipment rack. So, I mean, this slide shows our small form factor. Um, this one was based on 30 days, you know, not necessarily specific to gaming if you need 30 days, typically gaming seven to 14 days, but you kind of get the point that, you know, you can record 215 cameras or double that for seven days uh, in a 4U space and then grow up to, you know, 750 cameras in an 8U space. And that really covers the majority of installations, but you'll have some larger ones. And the larger ones, you know, the larger SAN, you can have approximately, again, 1,200 cameras if you need 30 days or 2,400 in that 7U enclosure and then grow it up to 10 petabytes uh, in a single rack. And if you want to go to the next slide for me, David. So this kind of shows our scale, right? It's kind of how effectively we can scale from a small 4U enclosure, you know, all the way up to the big, you know, full rack, 10 petabyte um, enclosure there. So I, I know it sounds complicated. You know, it's, it's really not. Um, but we do rely heavily on our integration partners like TD Cynics, uh, who basically provide just a vast number of integration services to ensure, you know, every installation is plug and play. Uh, and with that, I'll transition over to David Smith. Hey, uh, thanks, Scott. So the goal of this solution was, was twofold. Uh, it was not only to create a video surveillance framework that would be robust, performant, and resilient, but we also wanted to make this uh, easier for the on-site integrators. So the reference architecture framework that Scott had previously outlined provides the end customer with a fully racked and integrated solution uh, with room for support expansion options such as additional drive shelves or additional recording servers, allowing for the nonlinear scalability uh, that Scott had uh, made mention of earlier or the ability to scale compute and storage resources independently. Uh, while not needed in this particular implementation, uh, optionally, uh, for an easier plug and play integration, we can also add a, a different redundant switches from all of the popular switch vendors that are out there, uh, patch panels. Again, all of this is based on the customer's network design criteria. Uh, as a further call out, as indicated by the photos, by performing the rack stack and integration and initialization of the software, uh, we uh, fundamentally provide the integrator and, and, and customer with a uh, faster time to deployment. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn things back over to David to talk about video walls. All right, thanks, David. So one really um, central feature of any casino uh, surveillance system will be some kind of control center from which all of the different uh, cameras are monitored, of course. And one thing that Axon One does to support this is the video wall management feature. So a lot of times it can be kind of difficult and finicky to set up a video wall system. It might require connecting different computers together as well as the different screens, but with Axon One, it's easy to move views from one terminal, say, to another. Suppose an operator sees something on their terminal and needs to move it up to a larger screen on the wall so that a supervisor might be able to take a look at it. So this doesn't require any specialized equipment. Axon One does it all over TCP IP, as you can see in the example. And it really allows for a seamless and easy integration of video walls, as well as transferring and monitoring all sorts of different views. So, of course, uh, casinos have uh, different kinds of um, surveillance centers. It might come in different forms. And um, something, we talk, um, something we talked about, Scott, is like what kinds of different uh, surveillance centers and, and what different levels of uh, elaborateness and different setups uh, might we encounter in casinos? You know, you know, things, you know, it really varies. Like I've seen, you know, small surveillance rooms and basically closets where there's one operator and four monitors to, you know, Christie micro tile monitor walls that are 40 feet long. So, it, it, you know, it really, it really varies. Uh, I, I think um, some of the important things, like I like to talk um, specifics here, like, so, you know, if we look at different scenarios, so in a typical casino, um, 
the operators, you, you've got three shifts, right? You have a day shift, you have a swing, and you have a graveyard. So I think a value to the casino would be if the day shift operator could come in, because everybody watches different things. Each shift has specific things they watch, right? From casino floor to pits to the drop, things like that. So when the operator comes on, would they have the, again, two questions here. Would they have the ability to log into their keyboard and then whatever they like to view on their overhead monitors, they pop up? Um, I know it's like a macro. And then secondly, um, to take that a little bit further, if there is an alarm in the casino, let's say, let's say there's somebody messing with an ATM or a TRU, um, would you have the ability to pop up an alarm monitor so the surveillance operators could see it on the overheads, then they would acknowledge it by dragging it to their workstation, and then that person would be responsible to deal with that alarm? Yeah, absolutely. Those are some really great questions, and those sorts of scenarios are perfectly suited actually for our solution. So we do have a macro system which has a powerful degree of automation that's capable with that. So things like different layouts between users would be very easy with this kinds of system, as well as responding to different alarms. If there's a alert or alarms that, that's detected, uh, you could even have that show up in a larger view right away. So it's, it's very easy for operators to know right away when an alarm occurs or something happens and have that brought to their attention and then be able to address it by seeing it in a larger view and know right away where that's happening. That's a really great example, yeah. So uh, cameras aren't the only thing that have to be monitored in casinos. They might not be the only devices uh, that you might want to connect to the system. So an additional thing that you can do with Axon One is connect certain external devices directly to the system. So of course, ATMs and uh, ticketing machines, TRUs, as you can imagine, are a pretty central component of the um, casino floors. Uh, but there's also support for other integrations like point of sale devices, that would be something like a cashier stand at a bar within the casino or perhaps a restaurant. So these sorts of devices can send information straight into Axon One. Uh, it can be overlaid directly over the screen uh, where say a camera is watching a certain point of sale device. Maybe there's a camera looking at it. And at the same time, if anything is checked out on that, or perhaps it's data coming from ATM or uh, TRU, uh, that can be shown over the screen, uh, overlaid on top of that. And it's also searchable later for investigation. So if you go back through things like transaction data, you're able to search for transaction amounts or items, and you're very easily able to search for this. And you can find that, you can find the exact time something happened, and then you can review that particular footage. So um, Scott, do you have any um, particular ideas of um, some situations that this could be handy? I mean, I think you covered them. I just, from a clarification standpoint, so if you're interfacing to ATM TRU machine, and you can go back after the fact and search by say invalid ticket. If somebody was trying to make a copy of a, a slip they got from a slot machine and try and you know present it more than once. So you could go back and search all that video by that or specifics at a bar, right? Those would be the big issues would be TR, TRU machines, ATMs, and then again, you know, point of sale stuff for bars, I think would be the biggest value. That's right. That kind of in investigation would be very easily streamlined by using the search and being able to look through that data which is collected and of course uh, it's going to be associated with certain footage so not only do you do you have the, the transaction information or uh, ticketing information that you can look through but also the video footage to review right uh, something else that comes up in investigations and uh, monitoring certain events is monitoring license plates and detection of certain vehicles. Uh, Axon One has powerful license plate recognition and search functions uh, that are useful for detecting certain vehicles. It could be the vehicle of a VIP to look out for, or it could be the license plate of a known bad actor, perhaps someone on an exclusion list, a uh, known cheater, or even self-exclusions. So license plates that are recognized uh, from a watch list can be detected right away and have appropriate action taken, like setting off an alarm, and you can also search through archive footage for certain license plates. You can type them in uh, if you know the whole license plate, but if you know only part of it, you can use a wildcard to search any license plates that match 
uh, that particular fragment. One other upcoming powerful feature for investigations in the search function will be the ability to search also not just for license plates, but also for vehicle color, model, and make. So it makes it very easy to find certain vehicles if you know only part of the information about it. Perhaps you didn't catch a license plate. You can filter like by color, like I mentioned, but the system can also distinguish certain brands of vehicle. Uh, for example, if you want to search for Audi or BMW, all the vehicles of that brand will show up. The system uses machine learning to detect the vehicles <coughs> by, their, uh, by their make as well as their model. So it's not just looking at the badge at the front, but rather the whole appearance of the car to be able to detect that. So uh, Scott, what might be some particular uh, usage of this search? Uh, because yeah, so um, there's going to be parking lots near. Um, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, no, where I've really seen it, the need for the technology is, you know, like a lot of the First Nations casinos, a lot of them are in neighborhoods. So typically after like a, a bank robbery, the bad actors pull into a casino um, or, you know, the local PD catches them on a street cam or something. Then they come into the casino and they start asking the operators, hey, can we, if they don't have the license plate, they'll say, hey, I need to search for the make and model of this vehicle and see if anybody's pulled in your garage. Because obviously the garages have thousands of cars, right? Uh, casinos and airports or parking lots are just the perfect places for bad actors to try and hide cars because there's just so much volume. Um, so yeah, that I see that that comes up quite a bit. Um, love that feature with the make and model. Uh, one question I do have though, taking it kind of to the next level, do you guys have the ability to track individuals the same way? Uh, yes, we do. And um, that's another... Um investigation and search function. We actually have a question from the chat regarding uh, angle limit for detecting a license plate. Uh, good question, Terry. Uh, there is going to be a certain uh, angle required. It will have to be roughly horizontal. I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but for example, vertical camera uh, won't work uh, if it's facing straight down, for example. So it will need to be, it, it will need to have a certain range that it will be in to work properly and be able to read license plate, uh, but it's it's not gonna be like perfectly horizontal. You will have some leeway in it how you're able to place it. Typically above and beyond angles, you really have to watch for headlights at night. So it's, it's better to try and catch a license plate from the rear at night. Uh, and of course, LED lights also have a huge impact, right? LED tail lights, because they really, you have to really watch your settings. So yeah, there's no, unfortunately, no magic wand. You really have to be careful on angles and settings and where you place cameras and, and take all the lighting stuff into consideration. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Scott, you mentioned uh, searching for uh, individuals instead of vehicles in um, the archive footage, and that's something uh, that we can do as well, certainly. So, one a uh, powerful upcoming feature we have will be the similarity search. And so uh, this works similarly to say a facial search, except it uses a whole person's appearance and their aspect to be able to search them through multiple camera views. So if you don't have a clear view of someone's face, maybe they're facing the other way, you can't get a clear picture of them on the camera view. The system will look at their whole appearance, so their whole body and their clothing. And when you upload a, an image of that person, you'll be able to search across multiple cameras and then do a powerful investigation of, uh, here's every different location that they showed up in, uh, even if their face is not detected. So that's, it's a very powerful tool for investigations. Um, Scott, is there, is there particular use cases that you have in mind? Um, yeah, I do. Like I always like talking specific applications, right? So what I see is, you know, um, let's say there's someone cheating in a table game, you know, the the pit boss, it's his responsibility on the floor to keep an eye on what's happening in the pit. But then he calls up to surveillance and says, hey, I think uh, this individual, they're gambling strange, right? Something's not right. They're, they're acting, their behavior's weird, or they suspect something. So then it's surveillance's job to follow that individual, you know, at that specific table. But what they also need to do is they want to go back. You know, where was this person before this table? Was he, were they in another pit? Were they at some slots? Where are they cheating? What are they doing, right? So the cool thing, I think we need this for a long time in gaming. If they could, surveillance could follow that individual all the way back to their car. You know, not only would we get make and model of the car, but maybe even a plate number. And that, I mean, talk about a valuable tool. I mean, that's very, very, really highly needed feature, um, in my opinion, in casinos. Absolutely, yeah. That sort of use case uh, works perfectly with this sort of system, that kind of investigation. 
would really be streamlined uh, with that particular analytic. Uh, one concern people might have is that uh, people's privacy might be infringed by uh, having their faces looked at uh, in the cameras and in, are shown in the archive footage. Uh, as one feature, the, one thing that we can do about that is uh, privacy masking and blurring. So uh, you can have it set so that people's faces are blacked out in the camera view as well as the archive footage later. And you could also block out uh, certain areas of the camera view uh, if you want to mask off a whole region, which we don't want to have viewable, uh, that's possible. So we have a few examples of masking here uh, for compliance in certain areas. Uh, something else we can do, uh, instead of just a black mask uh, over a certain area, we can instead do privacy blurring. So here we have an example of a person tracking combined with that blurring. It's blurring the person's whole shape uh, whenever they show up, or it could just be constrained to a person's face. So you can see here that uh, even though the system is still able to perform its analytics, if someone is viewing this on the camera view, or if they're looking at the archive footage, uh, they'll instead see this uh, blurred view uh, so as to um, comply with certain privacy concerns. So, uh, Scott, we talked about some places where, uh, I remember we discussed some instances where uh, this might be particularly necessary, like um, uh, certain regions or, or demographics you have in mind? Yeah, so I think a uh, great value here for, you know, First Nations casinos are typically in neighborhoods where commercial casinos are really more in a commercial business environment. But, you know, for the, from the First Nations casino standpoint, I mean, if they've got a pan and tilt outside, which they would have several, right, the ability to mask. So when they go past the house, it would block out windows and doors and things like that where they couldn't look into the house. I, mean, I think that's a great value. Yeah, this this would that masking of the areas would be perfect for that situation. Another thing that we're able to detect is uh, certain poses and behaviors. So this uses AI to detect a person's body and limbs individually. Uh, we can do things like checking for man down events. Someone perhaps has fallen down in an emergency. Uh, we can also check to see if people are crouching and perhaps tampering with the ATM or ticketing machine. Uh, this analytic can also be used to as you can see in the video, to be checked, um, used to check for lines of individuals. Maybe there's too many people getting in line for something, there's, or there's too many people crowding into a certain area. So uh, this, among other different behaviors, are things that we're able to check for and uh, alert operators to. So if this detection analytic is triggered and it detects something happening, the system will be able to set off an alert to an operator and let, let the operators or security know right away if something is happening on the floor of the, in a certain event. So, uh, Scott, what kinds of um, situations, uh, in addition to this, uh, do you think this might be useful for? I remember we talked a bit about um, certain applications of uh, man down detection, for example. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the biggest issues in the casino is, is slips and falls, right? And, you know, I was going to say nine times out of 10, that's probably a bit of an exaggeration, but probably a good seven times out of 10, you know, the individual spills some liquid on the floor, walks a few steps away, turns around, walks back and slips and falls in the area because it's, you know, then they can file a, a bit of a, a threat of a lawsuit or a small claim against the casino, you know, two, three thousand dollars And it's actually cheaper for the casinos to pay that claim than get legal involved and insurance and everything else. So that happens a lot. I think this would be great from a surveillance operator standpoint, if they see a man down, it's almost live. Um, so would this be able to like uh, pop up on a monitor, on the alarm monitor, you know, when an event like that would happen, you could trigger that alarm, correct? Through a macro? That's right. That's so so these, mm -hmm. these kinds of detection events, uh, they work perfectly for the macro. So macros use an if-then logic. There's the if component, if something's detected or if a camera goes online or motion is sensed in a certain area. The then portion is then the appropriate action uh, that the software takes and automates. It can be just something as simple as playing a sound. Uh, it can be something more complex, like setting off an alert and showing a window saying, here, something's happening here, or sending some kind of email or uh, text notification to a supervisor. And of course, any different number of things can be stringed together in terms of automation. So a single trigger can actually set off uh, multiple different automation events happening. So there's a great deal you can do with that. And uh, that's one particular application that that would be suited for. 
I think it would be great with that is tied into um, your uh, identify people by appearance, right? Same thing. If somebody slips and falls, go back and follow them. Yeah, go back and follow them for an hour. Go back, whatever. I mean, they could have done this a long time ago where traditionally without that capable or the capability of technology, the operator would go back maybe a few minutes. They, they don't have a lot of time to spend on it, right? So a capability like that would be would be gold. Definitely, yeah. It's it's all integrated to, together in the search, uh, which is quite easy to use. So like you said, if someone uh, is detected slipping and falling, uh, you can go to the archive footage and right away, there's actually like a box around them, you can click on them and then right away you can go to the similarity search from that to be able to find all the times that they showed up in the archive footage. So these kinds of analytic and search features are very easy to use in conjunction. Great. So we've heard a lot of different ways that we can do investigation. So once those investigations are done, sometimes it's important to be able to share that archive footage. And um, Exxon One has a very easy to use uh, export function. You can export single or multiple camera views. And one thing that you can do with multiple camera views is actually string them together into a single output file. So uh, perhaps you have some kind of individual that's, they've been tracked across multiple cameras and maybe we even use one of the search functions like similarity search to see them across multiple cameras. So if we have detected evidence of something happening, it's very easy to select those uh, different bits of footage and then string them together and then have a single video file that's exported for that. Uh, Scott, I think we discussed this before, like it, there's um, some use cases in which we can it's to be useful for sharing that with uh, law enforcement or uh, authorities. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, where I see, you know, from the past, right, what I've seen is if a cage in a casino ever gets robbed, and that's typically where a holdup happens, right? Somebody's cashing a bad check or they're trying to hold up a cage window. You know, it's when a casino gets robbed, it's like almost everything shuts down, right? Um, surveillance is all hands on deck. They're dedicated to see what happened and try and pull all that evidence together so they can create the reports. So the ability to, to sync four to six to eight cameras, however many, uh, do a synchronized playback so they can see where this individual came from, where they went, what actually happened at the cage, you know, and then export that, all that video onto a single clip uh, just makes it, I mean, that's, that's the that's what we're supposed to do, do, right? That's what analytics and AI do, right? They make the jobs easy for the integrator or easy for the operators, you know, to do their jobs, basically. Less time, more efficient, a lot quicker um, to solve stuff like this. I, that's great. Definitely, yeah. That would be something that's, uh, just like you said, it's all about making it easier for operators to use and streamlining the process, taking out a lot of the uh, menial, or repetitive or unnecessary work uh, that could be done with this automation. So finally, some other analytic features that we offer include things like uh, facial recognition, as well as the age and uh, guesstimation from that. So this is very useful for cases like uh, excluding um, underage gamblers. It, of course, age guesstimation is never gonna be able to tell exactly how old someone is, but uh, being able to estimate someone's age and see early on in dispatch security uh, can be very useful to be able to do just automatically. Uh, with facial recognition, you're also able to do exclusions of um, self-exclusions perhaps, or there's an exclusion list of known cheaters or bad actors. So that's something you can do early on with um, uh, cameras that are uh, angled so as to catch people's faces. With cameras uh, pointed down also at the entrances and exits of buildings, uh, you can perform visitor counting analytics. So uh, this will be useful for knowing exactly how many people are in the building. Uh, perhaps there's occupancy monitoring going on in certain situations. So any situation where instead of having to have someone just stand at the front of the building, for example, counting how many are going in and going out, that's another feature uh, that can be automated with our analytics. All the data collected from these uh, age, uh, age estimation, as well as visitor counting, uh, can also be really neatly visualized in uh, easy to read graphs and collections of that information. So, yeah, uh, I, mean, mm -hmm. I, just, I think that's probably one of your best features, quite honestly. I mean, 
the ability for the technology to identify an underage gambler. I mean, if they see that, even if it's close, they, you know, surveillance will call down to the floor and have somebody go card that individual, right? Because casinos get fined for things like that. And, and self-exclusions is the other biggie. I, I think, I'm not sure a lot of people understand maybe what self-exclusion is. So a self-excluded gambler is basically somebody that says, hey, look, I've got a gambling problem. I know it. So they tell the casino. The casino then takes pictures of their IDs. They take, you know, uh, pictures of their faces. They get vehicle information. They get all that. So that person is no longer allowed in the casino. Well, once once a patron does that, it's then it becomes a casino's responsibility to keep them out which is crazy, but it, it is. So the casino is liable. If that person comes back into that casino and gambles and loses money, they can sue the casino saying, hey, look, I, I told you I had a problem. So, you know, these kind of things, and these are all things that casinos get fined for. So that makes them a big, big deal. And to be able to identify these individuals quickly, hopefully before they even come into the casino, again, that's what a what a great feature that is. I, I love that. So the one, I think you touched on it too. The one thing I want to clarify is even though you've got your privacy masking on, like blurring of faces, the analytics still work, so it can still identify, you know, whoever you need it to identify, correct? That's right. The masking uh, will cover up people's faces or the whole appearance on, for example, the operator's views. The operator will not be able to see it. And if you go back to the archive footage, you can also have it blacked out. But the analytics themselves uh, will able, they'll still be able to function on the video footage. So the, the analytics themselves are, are are actually looking at it, even if the operator themselves or any human on the end uh, cannot. That's right. right. All right, I'll hand it over to Don um, now. Hey, thanks, uh, David and Scott. Um, that was exceptional. And Scott, clearly your experience in this industry really pays off because uh, as we put this whole project together, which um, David Smith uh, showed a short while ago, it, it was a real team effort. And believe me, um, from a TD Cynic standpoint, having the uh, experience and expertise of Axonsoft and NetApp to pull this together uh, really meant a lot. And you know, more importantly, um, as solutions like these get delivered, it's not, uh, when we say plug and play, it's just not that it got plugged in and played. The uh, support continues, continues this week. And that's, that's, the, that's what's really important about the type of, um, of uh, capabilities that we collectively bring. So I'm going to uh, wrap up the formal presentation section here by summarizing the global capabilities at Cynex. Now, we're enabling our system integrator, resell, and vendor partners to expand their reach by leveraging our capabilities as a solution aggregator for the IT ecosystem. Now, we've shown a great example of this with the First Nations um, project that um, We've, we've highlighted. And, and you know, that was a platform for casinos. And together with Shift Global Services, you know, we're providing a wide range of aggregated solutions that, that simplify decision making and time to market for partners and customers. And it goes across a really large swath of uh, verticals, including, for example, hospitality, retail, industrial, healthcare, and transportation, among others. Uh, David, if you can go to the next slide. So I won't try to go through all of this here, but clearly there's a, a, a lot of integration going on here. And you know, we, we have a vast array of integration capabilities that are summarized here that have a major impact on, on simplifying complex solutions. I cannot tell you how many times we get calls to you know, answer questions and pull together bills of materials and, and, and recommend solutions um, you know, to go with our partner ecosystem that, that take the guesswork out for integrators and resellers and partners that, that really are looking for that kind of, uh, you know, one, one stop shop to pull all this together. So, you know, we've got the knowledge based experience and proven track record to assist our partners and, and look forward to the opportunity to work together with you. So, um, Kate, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I think we've got some time uh, for Q&A here. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending our session today. Team, great presentations. Yes, we do have a few very interesting questions. I think the first one would go to Scott. What differentiates NetApp from an NVR? Uh, yeah, so NetApp, you know, an NVR is what we call white box, right? All the components are generic where, you know, NetApp is, it's an enterprise class device, right? So all components are redundant. Um, 
uh, you know, other than power, fans, controllers, things like that, components on board are redundant too. So NetApp proudly offers, you know, six nines of availability, which means basically it just, it never goes down, right? So we're an MBR, I'll get myself probably in trouble a little bit here, uh, again, my opinion, but back in the day, and I'll date myself as well, right? So back in the day, they came out with this big fancy format TV with, an, with a VCR and a DVD all built in. It was great, right? It was the easy button because you could use one remote. I mean, all the components were absolute crap, but you could still use one remote to control it. And that was the easy button. And that's kind of how I look at the NBR, right? It's There's not a lot of value in the box, but it, it's easy to install because all you have to do is put it in place and plug it in. Okay, thank you, Scott. And I think we have one more question, which we could address to you right off. How does NetApp handle RAID? So that's a great question. Um, so NetApp has, you know, several patents on this feature they call DDP, it's dynamic disk pooling. So essentially, if you look at a RAID controller, you know, all the information is written to a single drive and it's striped across the drive, right? Um, so what NetApp does differently is NetApp stripes to all drives, including parity. So if a drive ever fails, um, you pull it out, replace it, and the drive doesn't have to get rebuilt. It just reloads the data to that drive. Uh, typically, we use 30 to 60 drive pools at NetApp, which means it's it's super, super fast. And what NetApp does in the background, they run an analytic or AI, and they monitor the status of the drive. So if they start getting some you know, I.O. errors, they'll actually shut down the drive and restart it. And this is all behind the scenes. The operator would never see this going on. Um, and, you know, as we start getting into these, you know, higher capacity drives, like an 18 terabyte drive. So if you were to take an 18 terabyte drive and an NVR and fail it, it's probably going to take, and, you know, David Smith could probably answer better, I don't know, two days, however long to rebuild that drive. Well, the way NetApp works is they rebuild critical sectors first. So within less than two hours, so we're talking within 90 minutes or so, NetApp will rebuild the critical sectors and reload all the data back on that drive. So you're not down very long and you wouldn't even notice it because there's so much other horsepower in the NetApp system because we're writing to all drives, not just striping each drive. So yeah, big difference in rebuild times, which would be critical for casinos. And then like I said, when a drive goes down, you would never see performance degradation like you would in a VCR. Yeah, you wouldn't see performance degradation and also uh, it's double parity rate as well. So you can sustain a single drive failure and still, and while that, while the entire rate array is still running, you're going to have that rapid rebuild uh, doing its job in the background so that your uh, your availability is a, a, a lot higher than for a traditional NVR. Thank, Thank you, you for great answers. Uh, I think we have a few questions to Axonsoft. David, what differentiates Axonsoft from competition? That's a great question. So there's three things that really come to mind for me. The first of them is our interface. So the interface of Axon One is designed to be both um, easy to customize and easy to learn and use. So it doesn't take many months of training an operator to learn how to use it. You can learn in just a few hours how to figure out how to, how to perform certain tasks, get set up and do certain things with it. It's really customizable as well in terms of how much you can do in terms of uh, changing and moving around the interface. You, you have a huge amount of freedom in terms of the camera views you can put in different event boards or system health information, all integrated in one place. It's not spread across multiple screens or views. You can have that all in one place where you're seeing uh, the footage as well as that information. You can switch between live and archive view very easily. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. The next thing is our unique and capable AI analytics. So we offer a wide variety of different AI and machine learning based analytics. And these are pretty much all developed in house, which gives us full control over the development life cycle. Uh, we're able to make them from scratch a lot of times. And sometimes people can even ask for uh, custom analytics. So maybe there's some kind of special application that they want. And so they can send us example data, training data of that, like a video. And a lot of times we can figure out, hey, with a bit of work, we can make this custom analytics that never existed before. I can check for something totally new that someone requested. And this whole process is just done in-house, start to finish, which uh, takes me into my third point. Since that brings down cost, uh, we also have uh, a perpetual licensing model. So some vendors, they'll keep charging you every month 
every year to have their system keep working. We don't do that. Uh, we have a perpetual licensing model where you buy it once and then you have it forever. So um, having all that cost front loaded is actually a lot of times can over time be quite beneficial to just, you know, you have it once and you don't have that recurring fee of having to pay that again and worry that in a year or five years, your system's gonna suddenly stop working. All right, thanks a lot, David. And I think there's one more question for you uh, from James. If we have other OEMs interested in utilizing Accentsoft software with their hardware, is that something that you would consider? Yeah, it, we can work with all sorts of hardware in terms of both um, cameras and then servers that runs on. So Windows, Linux uh, would be fine for the server. Uh, and then in terms of hardware, all the different devices that can be um, connected, just a, a huge variety of different things that will work with it. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're vendor agnostic. It's not going to just lock out certain vendors or we're going to require a certain manufacturer for something. So you have a huge degree of freedom in terms of, uh, in terms of that. Hey, Kate, I wanted to yeah. just call on David Smith a second. He, he can give some color to... Um, what we do with Accentsoft um, and being vendor agnostic, uh, some of the testing and development work we've done. David, you want to just comment on that? Sure, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, ab absolutely, Donna. We have done uh, extensive testing uh, with Accentsoft and their ability uh, to scale cameras. And uh, some of the uh, testing that we've done, I just want to be clear, this is on non-analytics, uh, and this is pure video streams. Uh, we're talking uh, upwards of over a thousand uh, streams onto a single node uh, with failover capabilities. Uh, in terms of ease of use, uh, I didn't have any experience uh, leveraging Accentsoft before, and uh, the UI just made, wh whoever did the UX design was phenomenal because everything uh, just makes sense. I had to reference the uh, the online uh, uh, instructions a, a, a few times, but aside from that, uh, installation is very straightforward. Camera connects is very straightforward. Setting up archives is very straightforward, um, and it, it's they're they're just a joy to work with. Thanks a lot, David, for great comments. Uh, and David, I think we have one more question to Axonsoft. Should detection be done from camera or with your software? Another really great, great question. So uh, the answer, the quick answer for that is you can do both. So we of course offer a wide variety of different analytics that I mentioned that can run on the server. So the camera, just any camera without any special features or anything, uh, we'll work with that as long as it, as long as the parameters are correct, you know, a little super compressed camera view might not be useful for analytics, but any decent resolution camera, a lot of those analytics are going to work just fine with it. Doesn't need any special uh, technology or AI in the camera. Doesn't, doesn't need a ultra 8K HD camera either for these to work. Um, but if you do have cameras that have AI, if they have some kind of edge analytic uh, that also works perfectly with Axon 1. The information will, uh, will be fed uh, straight into the system. It'll integrate with all the other features and detection and the triggers search. Uh, and when you, when you run edge analytics, I mean, you're not having to run any analytics on the server. So it's almost as if, in terms of CPU load, it's almost as if you had, uh, we're not running like any analytics at all. And it really um, cuts down on the load for that. So. Um, I guess just to reiterate, you can go with both, just normal cameras with no analytics and the run analytic on the server or edge analytics uh, where the camera itself is doing some kind of AI. Thanks, both work fine. Thanks, David. And Don and David, I think we have a great question for you guys. I know what Accentsoft does and I know what NetApp does, but why would I want to partner with TDCNX? <laughs> yeah, why? Why? Do you want to take a stab at that first? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take first crack at it. Uh, there are kind of two, two thoughts here. Uh, the first would be our ability to kind of aggregate solutions from disparate technology vendors like you're, you're seeing here at scale, not just here in the U.S., but also globally. And quite frankly, very few companies, let alone distributors, have that kind of footprint. And the other thing would be uh, our ability to accelerate the solutions time to market. Uh, with our breadth of services, as Don has pointed out multiple times, our substantial ecosystem of partners, uh, we can, in essence, fa facilitate fundamentally any customer's 
integration re request. And uh, Don, from a business perspective, what are your thoughts? Yeah. yeah, thanks, David. Yeah, I think from my perspective, um, it's pretty easy to partner with us. Um, and I, I, I often, I've been with the company about, uh, well, coming on two years now, and I joined right before it became TV Cinex, but there's so much going on in this company, uh, you have to peel it back and look, but I, I think from the audience we have here and where the, where the real opportunities are, it's just that complete array of products and support that we offer. And I'll give an example. Um, uh, David talked about what I think, David Trillo, a, a huge benefit uh, with Axensoft of that perpetual license up front. That's the good news. The challenge on that could be for a, a, a partner or a customer is financing that, is if it was a large project and it required that upfront payment, good news is you're not gonna have to make a payment again, but uh, TD Capital comes into play. We've got a wide array of financial solutions that can be implemented as well. So when you, you look at our, our company holistically, there are just so many pieces. That's why we're a $62 billion plus company and growing. Um, but I, we, I think we bring peace of mind to our partners and customers and, and you know, really the technical and marketing capabilities that we provide are second to none. And I think lastly, we just seem to have this innate ability to connect vendors and partners to opportunities. Um, and, you know, Axensoft and NetOp are a perfect example. And this, hopefully what our audience is seeing today is this synergy that we have together is something we replicate every day you know, across our entire portfolio and uh, um, the, the projects we have worked on and continue to work on are just a shining example of that. So that, hopefully that helps explain why I think we're an easy choice. Thank you, Don. Thank you, David, for great answer. I think for now we're through all the questions that we've had. Maybe we could give it another minute or so for our attendees to ask more questions. So maybe while we're waiting for more questions, we could give some final notes. Uh, all right, yeah. Thanks to everyone um, who joined today and thank you to my wonderful fellow presenters as well. Um, Scott, Don, David, I think is a good discussion. We managed to uh, cover a lot about our solution today. And we appreciate the invite. It's good to be here. Second that. Thank you very much. And we're excited about the future and, and particularly for this, this audience here and beyond, um, you know, understanding our capabilities and uh, what we can do together is, is hugely important. And we look forward to partnering together. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Really appreciate the time. Thank you, team. And everyone have a great rest of the day. See you at our next joint event. Thank, Thank you. you.